all over here, even though from distance. So um, our initiative uh, was started a couple of months ago, and it is a joint uh, project with the, uh, with the new Bulgarian University. So Bogdan Atanasov is the coordinator uh, uh, of that um, um, seminar, as well as to some other programs which we have joined with the new Bulgarian University. Tonight is a very special evening for us uh, and uh, to me as well, because I'm really glad to introduce you Dr. Matthew Schuller. Um, it's great because uh, this is one of the persons who, um, who was a, an alumni of ours and who joined one of the first projects which we ever organized back in uh, 2009. I think, uh, at the site of Heraclea Linkestis, uh, nowadays uh, the Republic of North Macedonia. So Matthew was a student at that time, uh, and later on he became an instructor in our field school. Uh, also, he formed his scientific uh, interest, I believe, uh, mainly because of the site we used to work at that point. This was the Roman and late Roman site of Heraclea Linkestis, uh, and later on, he um, he started his PhD, uh, focused on the architecture of the Balkans. I'll tell you more details in a second about that. And uh, I'm really glad that he actually finished uh, that PhD this year. Matthew, you're muted. Please unmute yourself. I was just saying, me too. I'm quite glad I finished too. Yeah. So uh, it's a great success for all of us, I believe, and I'm really glad, uh, glad again to have you, Matt, over here tonight, practically presenting uh, part of that uh, PhD thesis, which was written in the past couple of years. Mm, and now I'm going to give you more details about uh, Dr. Schuller's um, scientific career. So uh, he, as I just tell you, uh, told you, he recently received his PhD in classics with a specialization in Roman archaeology from the University of North Carolina in Chapel, Chapel Hill. And he's currently a visiting lecturer in the Department of Classic, uh, Classical Studies at the University of North Carolina and uh, at Greensboro. His primary research Interests are in urbanism, architecture, and cultural interaction in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, Empire like Trace, with a focus on the Balkan uh, provinces of Macedonia and Trace. His current research, uh, which he will be discussing a bit today, investigates how public entertainment venues in these provinces helped to shape the ideas, spaces, and artifacts of urban life by offering multifunctional opportunities for human interaction. So um, I started the story about how we all got to know Matthew. Uh, later on, he will became a supervisor of our projects, of the Balkan Heritage Projects, not only at Heraclea, but also at the sites of Apollonia Pontica uh, and Pistirus. And actually in the last two years before the pandemic started, he uh, started working as a research collaborator of our foundation in the site of Duclea, which is in Montenegro. So fingers crossed that soon we will be able to continue that project. It's an amazing site, an amazing project with a lot of potential. Mm, what else, Matt, if I'm missing something, you can finish the presentation of yourself. Otherwise, please, please, uh, the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Angela, for that, that introduction. It's very kind. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you all uh, and to see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. Um, so I thank you um, from Bal to Balkan Heritage and New Bulgarian University for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Um, and it's, it really is my pleasure um, to support their joint efforts to really promote greater international scholarly study and uh, a sense of bigger sense community uh, around the archaeology, the study of the archaeology of the ancient Balkans. So it's really a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, and so, yes, today um, I will be presenting a case study from what was my dissertation research, and it's still very much um, a big aspect of my current research. 
uh, into the ways by which public entertainment buildings, venues uh, in the Roman provinces of Macedonia and Thrace uh, stimulated different kinds of human interactions in their cities. And in doing so, I really focused on and stressed how they informed the material objects, the material forms, and the ideas that were associated with the urban landscapes in the provinces. Uh, so the first half of my talk uh, will introduce the parameters of my research. So I will address, um, I'll place my research generally in the current Roman archeological uh, scholarship, um, very basically and briefly. I will uh, define what I mean by Roman Thrace, um, <laughs> because that, that definition can change depending on time, of course. I will uh, discuss what I mean about ur mean by urbanism when I say that, when I say terms like urban landscapes. Um, and then um, I'll talk about why this discussion of urbanism uh, is pertinent to Thrace's integration into the Roman Empire. And then lastly, just connect this topic, urbanism, Roman Empire, Thrace, uh, to public entertainment venues in particular, and to the theater at Philippopolis, which is sort of my case study. And that's where I'll uh, focus my talking at the end um, toward the second half, the uh, theater of Philippopolis, uh, which as the title of my talk indicates, uh, I see as a setting, a dynamic setting uh, for the various kinds of interactions that you can say created and sustained urban life at Philippopolis, this metropolis of the Thracians in central Thrace. Um, so that being said, I'll, I'll start here. And um, if you have any questions at the end, I'm happy to hear them. I'm happy to hear about your thoughts and how um, I can expand my research and tweak it here and there. So I am looking forward to your thoughts. Uh, so thank you ahead of time. So the parameters of my research. So my research generally addresses how urbanism in the ancient regions of Macedonia and Thrace dynamically shaped how their communities participated in the Mediterranean wide network of diverse interactions that, was, uh, that were occasioned by Roman imperialism from the late first into the fourth century AD. Uh, I explore this broader topic through an analysis of the cultural, political, religious, and economic interactions that took place in and around structures built to host performances for large, diverse audiences. Uh, so theaters primarily in the provinces of Macedonia and Thrace. Um, there's also a couple stadiums, there are Odea, the covered lecture halls, um, amphitheaters, a few of those, and then uh, Hippodrome as well um, in, in Thessalonica. Um, and of course, later on in Byzantium becomes Constantinople in, um, in Thrace, late antique Thrace. Uh, so I hold that through their multifunctionality, um, public entertainment venues represent in miniature the urban landscapes into which they were set. That is to say, like these urban landscapes, entertainment venues provided structured parameters for interactions among large and diverse crowds of people, and so prompted people to interact in particular but varied ways that generated the ideas and material forms associated with urban life. Uh, so these material forms include public buildings and spaces and artifacts like honorific and funerary monuments and consumer goods like ceramic lamps decorated with scenes from performances. In their general shapes, decorations, inscriptions, and functions, these material forms demonstrate the different kinds of interactions and ideas that Macedonian Thrace's public entertainment venues provoked. Switch slides here. So my study uh, fits the ongoing paradigm shift in Roman archeology span away from a monolithic view of the Roman Empire toward a more systematic awareness of the diversity of life in the, um, the Roman Empire's provinces and the active role that provincial communities played in the empire's articulation, maintenance, continuation. This shift requires the reconsideration of areas of the ancient Mediterranean that Roman and Greek archeologists and historians in the past and in some cases more implicitly than explicitly, have deemed peripheral and so of less significance for the construction of a larger narrative uh, about the ancient Mediterranean. Through my ongoing research then, I hope to help further integrate the ancient regions of Macedonia and Thrace into international scholarship um, on classical archeology. span uh, These two regions were at a pivotal junction of the ancient Mediterranean 
and so are, of course, vital for understanding the diversity of communities across the Roman Empire and the complex cultural, political, religious, and economic, what have you, interactions that bound all these areas of the empire together. And so here's a good, good map um, of the sort of um, the Roman Empire by AD 117. And we see, of course, in the middle there, the provinces around which I focus my research, Thrace and Macedonia, which I kind of like to think forming sort of a belt of the ancient Balkans there. For my talk today, I'll concern myself with Roman Thrace, Philippopolis, and this the city's theater. Defining Roman Thrace in geographic terms is, as most of you know, is somewhat complicated since the boundaries of Thrace as an administrative province directly under the control of a Roman governor, they, these boundaries change fairly frequently between the uh, province's establishment under the Emperor Claudius in 46 AD and the fourth century AD. Uh, between 46 and the late third century, the Roman province of Thrace encompassed most of Thrace as the Thracians and their neighbors had traditionally conceived of it in preceding centuries, uh, as you can see on this map. So historically, the region of Thrace was generally sort of this area. And when you're talking about the Roman province of Thrace, the early Roman, mid-Roman province, you're talking about uh, specifically sort of this sort of area here. Um, so to the north, Roman Thrace differed from earlier conceptions of the region by not ending at the Danube River. Uh, instead, its northern border roughly ran along the northern side of the Hymus Mountains, and dipped to the southeast uh, to end at Masambria on the Black Sea coast. Uh, and Philippopolis was located in the plains at the center of the mid first to late third century AD Roman province of Thrace. So here you see Philippopolis here. Now, it is trickier to define Thrace geographically between the late third and going into the sixth century uh, because at the beginning of this period, which is traditionally called late antiquity, the Roman Empire's administrative districts were reorganized drastically uh, into a system of prefectures, dioceses, and smaller provinces than before. Uh, as you can see in this map, the earlier province of Thrace was subdivided into four smaller uh, provinces, um, even more, a lot of provinces up there now, um, and one of these provinces was still named Thrace. Uh, at the same time, uh, these new provinces and the provinces of Mesia, Secunda, and Scythia were grouped into a larger territorial unit, the diocese, also called Thrace, which reflected the traditional pre-Roman conception of Thrace, generally speaking. Philippopolis was located around the center of the new smaller province of Thrace and became this province's capital. So you can see Philippopolis there in this sort of late antique administrative re, uh, subdivision of uh, what was the older province of Thrace. So here we're going back to an early, that earlier, um, those earlier times. Uh, as was generally the case across the Mediterranean, Roman administrative control of Thrace provided a strong impetus for urbanism to become a more widespread and prevalent way of life for the Thracians. Uh, archaeologists who study the ancient Mediterranean are of course always looking to update their conception of urbanism so they can use their analysis of material remains to more accurately and vividly uh, discuss people's lived experiences of differently sized settlements across this vast area. Uh, my approach to urbanism in Roman Thrace draws on uh, a form of social network theory called actor network theory, uh, in which not only individuals or groups of people, but also individual and groups of ideas, objects, environmental features, and built spaces uh, are nodes that maintain networks of human interactions at different scales local scales at the site level, regional scales at a regional or provincial level, and then interregional level. So really this, this focus, this version of social network theory um, looks at the, which you can uh, kind of deem the agency of, um, of material things, uh, not just people. Um, this acknowledgement of intangibles and physical objects and spaces as actors in society comes from uh, actor network theory's core principle of radical relationality. And this is the idea that associations between people extend beyond the human participants themselves into the objects and the spaces they use. 
ideas, objects, and spaces thus gain this sense of agency, we could say, through their constant association with people. And so then they actively affect the ideological and tangible outcomes of people's interactions. So inspired by actor network theory then, I define urbanism as complexity that arises in a sizable and densely settled population. This complexity is characterized by a wide variety of interactions among many people who are diverse according to factors like profession, wealth, origin, legal status, etc. Uh, adding to this complexity are the interactions between these people and their environment and between people and the various ideas, artifacts, monuments, structures, and built spaces that their interactions with each other and their environment produced. So we're talking about a whole uh, web of sort of inter interconnections here between people, um, places, and things. Uh, so in my research, I use the term urban landscape to refer to a particular site at which urbanism is present. Um, I focus on cities uh, in Roman Thrace. In the future, I would like to go beyond cities and consider more the hinterland. But for now, my research is looking at cities. Um, and by that term, I mean the province's most complex urban landscapes. And this means sites at which have been found plentiful structural and artifactual evidence that indicates a high volume uh, and diversity of human and material actors. Between the mid second century BC and the early first century AD, when Roman involvement in the affairs of various Thracian tribes was steadily increasing, the settlement hierarchy in Thrace was largely similar, largely similar to what had been in the previous two centuries. Um, on the one hand, the Greek colonies in Aegean Thrace and on the Western Black Sea coast had long been city-states according to the Greek polis model. So Thracians were certainly familiar with what we can term advanced urbanization. Um, Thracians who lived in the Northern Aegean and along the Western Black Sea coast were certainly regular participants in the lives of these, of these polis, of these cities. On the other hand, um, most of the settlements of, Thr of Thrace's various groups, uh, which uh, scholarship generally refers to as tribes, uh, seem to have been relatively small in size and simple in terms of the number and diversity of interactions they accommodated. Um, citadel residences of Thracian kings and regional sanctuaries are among the sites that likely hosted more and more varied interactions. This general pattern of dispersed clusters of largely small settlements set in larger tribal territories started to change after the Roman Emperor Augustus took a more active role in patronizing a client kingdom of Thrace that had begun to emerge already around the mid first century BC. Um, this kingdom roughly covered the area that became the province of Thrace. Its development entailed Thracian client kings adjusting pre-existing tribal ter territories across Thrace and supporting the concentration of political and military authority at particular sites where loyal regional governors lived, so strategoi. Uh, this administrative reorganization of Thrace does not seem to have caused drastic change to settlement hierarchy in the region by the time it became a province. Uh, the re this reorganization does, however, seem to have provided a push toward the early development of centralized urban settings for human interaction and settlement across Thrace. Now, of course, I'm speaking of this settlement hierarchy in sort of early Roman, pre-Roman, early Roman Thrace in general strokes, and this I'm quite uh, aware this is a, a, to a lively topic of debate and scholarship nowadays. So the hope is that we'll get a better sense of the settlement hierarchy in pre-Roman Thrace as time goes on and research progresses. Um, Philippopolis, though, represents the trend of a more centralized focus for settlement in Thrace in the late 1st century BC to early 4th century AD. Uh, the site had long, 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 long been an attractive settlement location in central Thrace because of seven hills clustered on the southern banks of the Hebras River amid agricultural and grazing land. Macedonian kings like Philip II in the mid-4th and Philip V in the early 2nd century BC, uh, they recognized the defensive and economic advantages of the site as well, and so they made sure to capture it during their military campaigns into Thrace. Uh, Greek writers like Theopompus and the inhabitants of Roman Philippopolis they held that it was the first Philip who were named the site after himself. But of course, 
um, there's taught the discussion about this. Was this sort of a um, a way to really show off the greater antiquity of Philippopolis um, through claiming that descent from Philip um, II, as uh, scholars like Ivo Tokolilov have talked about, for example. Uh, so Philippopolis seems to have become a fairly sizable and populous settlement by the late first century BC, seeing as the kings of the Thracian client kingdom favored the site as a focal point for their political and economic oversight of, of Thrace, of Thrace's human and material resources. Uh, this is reflected in the monumental agora and orthogonal street system that were built at the site between the late first century BC and early first century AD. Uh, it is highly unlikely that these large scale projects would have been possible without the permission and financing of the first official, the first official Thracian client king, Rimatalkes I. Uh, the form of the agora um, was typical for others built at the same time across the Eastern Mediterranean at sites like uh, Athens and Delos, for example. Uh, the agora's construction thus indicates the expansion of political and economic interactions at Philippopolis in response to the increased movement into Thrace of people, objects, and ideas from nearby Roman provinces, such as Asia, Achaia, and uh, Macedonia. Uh, when Thrace became a province in 46, um, Roman emperors and governors, they encountered the difficult task of administer administering a large area mostly characterized by loosely defined territorial units and dispersed settlements. Uh, their solution to this dilemma was to wholeheartedly uh, patronize the development of larger urban centers across Thrace over the second half of the first and into the first half of the second century AD. Uh, in the second half of the first century, they used tactics such as the foundation of two legionary uh, veteran colonies at Apri in southeastern and Deoltum in central western Thrace. So here's Apri, here's Deoltum. And they also, um, Roman administrators, they also informally encouraged legionary and auxiliary veterans to settle at many other sites, uh, like Philippopolis, for example. Uh, in the early second century AD, uh, Roman emperors founded cities on the Greek polis model across Thrace, uh, at least in some cases um, near pre-existing settlements, although that's, of course, a big uh, subject of debate and, and a topic of research nowadays. Uh, that being said, it was certainly not Roman administrative concerns alone that were responsible for this, what I call an urbanization horizon in Thrace between the late first and early second century AD. Uh, Thracians and long established immigrants across the new province and new immigrants from other parts of the Roman Empire, like uh, Asia Minor, for example, um, were driven by various motivations to come together with their equally diverse ideas and objects, material goods, to build and benefit from the more complex network of interactions at sites like Philippopolis. So you get sort of Roman administrative concerns meeting a lot of local agency here. So in other words, Roman administrators, uh, they promoted significant changes to settlement patterns across Thrace, but these changes only took hold and were sustained because of the substantial participation of Thrace's elite and non-elite native-born and immigrant inhabitants. Uh, here is where my interest in Roman public entertainment venues and Philippopolis', Philippopolis theater come in. Uh, with urbanization came large-scale building projects that periodically transformed urban landscapes across Thrace beginning the late first to early second century AD. Like the people's objects and ideas in these urban landscapes, in their general forms and functions, these new structures or built spaces were in many ways like those at urban centers across the Roman Empire. They thus reflected Thrace's participation in a Mediterranean-wide Roman imperial network of connections. Uh, these building projects were intended by inhabitants of urban centers and their hinterlands uh, to facilitate these sites accommodation of a high volume and diversity of interactions. Uh, the most complex urban centers, cities, uh, were thus characterized by larger, more numerous, and a greater variety of built spaces. Uh, as much as in the Roman Empire's other provinces, for cities in Thrace, a public entertainment venue was a particularly potent product and driver of complex urban life because of its monumentality. And I contend, as Edmund uh, Thomas does, that in Roman architecture, the term monumental entailed not only a large size, 
uh, wide visibility and um, durability and quality in building materials, but also the capacity to host interactions that did not only involve practical considerations. You get a lot of symbolism here as well. Um, an entertainment venue was particularly monumental because it accommodated a variety of interactions among large cross sections of a city's population. An entertainment venue thus conveyed to other communities that its, its, its urban landscape, a particular urban landscape, played a leading role in guiding a region's participation in the Roman Empire. Uh, public entertainment venues in Roman Thrace were the same architectural type, types as those elsewhere in the empire. So if you look at table one, that shows the types of public entertainments these structures commonly and occasionally hosted. Um, in my dissertation, I predominantly considered entertainment venues that, have, that were excavated, that have been excavated. I did, however, also discuss or acknowledge examples of these structures that are known to have functioned between the late first and uh, fourth century AD based on isolated architectural remains and performance related artifacts and monuments. So for example, I fully recognize that most of the Greek colonies along the Northern Aegean and Western Black Sea coasts would have had theaters um, since they were standard for Greek colonies across the Mediterranean beginning around the late fourth century BC. Uh, many of these theaters then one would think though this bears uh, more research, um, would have functioned in Roman times after structural, mo structural modifications. Um, in my research, I've considered the theater a Maronia since it has been identified, excavated, and published. Otherwise, um, my research has predominantly focused on sites in inland Thrace, although I certainly intend to broaden my research into public entertainment venues um, in Thrace as more are either discovered or further um, discuss further publications. Uh, the entertainment venues and ancient cities I discussed in my dissertation are noted, noted in tables two and three, so you can check that out. Uh, in many past studies of Roman public entertainment venues, there is a reductionist tendency to largely discuss venues in isolation from their surrounding archeological contexts when they were used in the late, uh, when they were used in, in the second to late third century AD and not, and kind of not as much outside that time frame. And there's a reductionist tendency to look at them as social, socio-political arenas for the reinforcement of local elite and imperial authority. Um, the chronological and functional limitations that past scholarship has commonly imposed on entertainment venues across the Roman Empire are also partly caused by greater emphasis on architectural than associated artifactual evidence. In the last uh, 20 some years, however, Increasingly, more scholars are highlighting Roman public entertainment venues, multifunctionality, and long dynamic use histories. Um, and certainly more recent excavations are paying a lot more attention um, wh wherever these Roman um, public entertainment venues are found across the Mediterranean. More excavations are paying attention to what artifact assemblages are associated with these, with these structures, both inside the structures and around them. So things are changing and things are going in a, in a, very, a very productive generation. Um, uh, area, I think. So in my work, I endeavor to join all these efforts to revivify these important public buildings. And so drawing on the, the sort of uh, theory that I do, I emphasize that entertainment venues in Thrace, like Philippopolis's theater, they hosted various human interactions, which I broadly characterize um, as cultural, political, religious, and economic. Um, by cultural interactions, I mean encounters between performers and spectators at public entertainments that promote moral values or spread moral values like um, leisure, the value of martial skill and the value of artistic talent. Uh, I define political interactions among performers and spectators as those that led to the spread of ideas of hierarchy or of community. Um, religious interactions in entertainment venues were those that prompted the worship of various deities. Lastly, when I say entertainment venues hosted economic interactions, I mean that people gathered at and left these structures with the intent to sell, buy, and commission various monuments and goods. Um, so my work emphasizes that through the various interactions they accommodated, entertainment venues in Thrace, like Philippopolis' theater, actively promoted further human interactions and so regularly helped to contribute ideas, people, and various material forms to their cities. 
In their features, decorations, and inscriptions, these material actors, these new forms of, of material evidence, they attest to the ideas and to the people whose interactions led to these things to be produced and spread across urban, uh, urban spaces. Uh, this then is how I envision a public entertainment venue like Philippopolis' theater as what I call an urban network actor that shaped the ideological and material characteristics of its urban landscape. And so in turn, shaped understandings of urbanism in Roman, um, in, in Roman Thrace. So now we'll, we'll look at specifically at the example of Philippopolis' theater. Uh, the theater of Philippopolis, uh, as you can see in this uh, map, map taken from brochure of the, of the site, it's right here at the northern end of the city. Uh, it's, it's situated between two hills. Uh, it was oriented so that its seating area looked out over the city um, over a decorative three-story scene building. You can kind of get a sense of that here from this, this plan uh, of, the, of the city. And so here you see the, the modern streets set behind the, the little bits of the um, excavated orthogonal uh, grid system that have been excavated. Uh, it was, so the theater was oriented so that cedar theater looked out over the city. Uh, and like most known theaters in the Eastern Mediterranean, Philippopolis' theater blended Greek and Roman uh, conventions for theater architecture in the forms of its slightly over semicircular seating area. So you can see that there in the plan. So that's the kawea, of course, the kawea, or the koilon in Greek. Uh, you have the orchestra there, um, and a scene building, the skyna, with its three-story decorative facade, the skyne frons, and the tall, narrow stage. Um, so you can see already their sort of blend of ideas of uh, Greek and Roman um, theater architecture. The theater is estimated to have accommodated around 3,500 people uh, and so in its seating capacity indicates Philippopolis at least had several thousand inhabitants when the theater was built. Uh, and based on analysis of two statue bases that have had been dedicated in the theater scene buildings to the local elites Tiberius Claudius Sacerdos Julianos and Titus Flavius Cotus, the theater's construction has recently been redated to the last decades of the first century AD, uh, as opposed to it was thought to have been um, built in the early second century for a while. Um, it so the theater was therefore co uh, contemporary with other building projects like uh, the a reconstruction of the Agora and the addition of public buildings like a library archive and a city council chamber to the Agora's northern side. So you can see the Agora over here. You can see these buildings I just mentioned. So the first forms um, added there at the northern end of the Agora at the same time that the uh, theater was built, roughly speaking. Um, and these, so these building projects and those that came soon after in the early second century AD conveyed in their monumentality that by the late first century, Philippopolis had become home to a large and diversified growing population of Thracians and immigrants, including immigrants such as legionary veterans from Eastern provinces. Uh, as further testaments to the city's regional prominence in the late first century, the emperor Domitian granted the city permission to mint its own coins around 88, and he or his father or brother, it's unclear, allowed Philippopolis to use the honorary title of Metropolis, which is noted on those two statue bases I mentioned, the ones of Cotus and Julianus. Here are a couple of pictures I took of the theater. Uh, Philippopolis' theater then was built and periodically renovated in the early and late second and the early fourth century AD to be a lasting monument to Philippopolis's metropolitan status. As such, as this type of monument, it was structurally equipped to guide the variety of interactions that made this regional prominence for Philippopolis possible. I'll introduce a few artifacts, honorific and funerary monuments and public spaces discovered at Philippopolis that manifest the effects the theater had on urban life in the second to late fourth century as a setting for cultural and political interactions. So it's definitely focusing on the, uh, in this case, in this presentation, the cultural and political functions of, um, of the theater. As a space for cultural interactions, from its construction in the late first century, 
Philippopolis' theater hosted three kinds of public entertainments, dramatic performances, uh, gladiatorial battles, and animal hunts. It's a bit unclear which specific kinds of dramatic performances, but you can imagine things like mimes and pantomimes, choral displays, for example, perhaps traditional Greek, com uh, Greek uh, comedies, though it's a bit unclear. Uh, the last two kinds of performances, gladiatorial battles and animal hunts, would have required the larger space of the orchestra. You can see how large the orchestra is based on this uh, figure who is in the middle of the orchestra there. Uh, but the theater's tall, narrow stage was able to accommodate actors in um, traditional tragedies and comedies, or perhaps musicians who ac accompanied choruses or dancing in the orchestra. So whatever kind of performances the theater hosted, the skene fronds and the stage front, here they are reconstructed, uh, they had considerable potential to highlight these performances' messaging through their decoration. Uh, the uh, ornate columns and entablatures of the skinny fronds uh, at least impressed upon audiences the value of leisure as a reflection of and sustaining force for urban prosperity. The safety features that allow the theater to host gladiatorial games and animal hunts are as follows, and you see them there in the, in the pictures. Uh, you have a podium wall at the base of the cavea that and you can still tell from post holes that are there. It would have been topped um, in some cases by a netting system for additional protection. Uh, you had grills that closed the three staircases here, here, and here that uh, permeated the, uh, the podium wall in the cavea to reach the orchestra. Um, and then you had the, the paradois, the side entranceways, the gated entrances. They were probably added a little bit later on uh, early first century, uh, second century AD. And then you have the tall stage front here. So all these features are safety features um, that allowed for gladiatorial games and animal hunts to be um, um, hosted here. By highlighting the danger associated with such entertainments, these features work together to heighten excitement for an upcoming combat and to thereby help prepare spectators emotionally to scrutinize the traits and behaviors these agonist, agonistic performances showcased. It's like the sense if you go to a, a modern uh, MMA fight and you see the cage and you, you're already by the side of the cage to be ready to see some action and you're girding yourself to see that action. Um, the, elevator, um, the elevator installed in the orchestra in the, early, in the late second century AD, so I'll pop back a moment. This is that elevator shaft. It was connected to a uh, underground subterranean tunnel that led underneath the, the um, scene building, out the back of the scene building. So the installation of this elevator shaft, it probably came about right here. Um, it was able to further increase this sort of emotional uh, effect um, by adding more flair to the introduction of performers and animals into the arena. In their reliefs and inscriptions, several different kinds of finds from Philippopolis and its hinterland reveal themselves to be material outcomes of the theater's promotion of cultural values by hosting uh, animal hunts and gladiatorial games. Uh, one such find from the theater uh, that the theater helped to introduce to its urban landscape uh, is an architectural decoration in the form of a large limestone plaque that invited the general public to a set of performances in the theater. Uh, and in Watatio ad Munra, uh, here's a, that, that bit I'm referring to. Um, this this in Watatio would have been posted in a highly visible location, perhaps the Agora. Uh, dated to the late second century AD, uh, it announces two days of an animal hunts and gladiatorial battles. A relief of the gladiators, animal hunts and animal hunters and animals that crowds were to expect in these games, they joined the inscription. So you see, for example, one animal hunter, he is preserved. Uh, he is shown thrusting his spear uh, to the viewer's left, and his stage name, noticed here, is Mascalis, the mutilator. And it suggests he was, the stage name suggests he was known for qualities like martial skill, strength, and ferocity. And this decorative detail thus indicates that the theater's animal hunts prompted spectators to consider humanity's relationship with the natural world and the qualities that people were to embrace if they were to hold their own against nature's challenges, for example. The theater's capacity to shape its urban landscape by hosting gladiatorial battles and animal hunts 
is also attested in funerary monuments, like on the right, an altar dedicated to the deceased gladiator Victor. And this uh, funerary altar was found in Philippopolis's hinterland, and it's dated to the late second to early third century. As the inscription at the top and the bottom of the altar's relief panel records, Victor, the left-handed, was from Thessalonica. Another gladiator named Pinas killed Victor, and Victor's comrade-at-arms, Polynices, later avenged him by killing Pinas. The inscription therefore suggests that in gladiatorial games in Philippopolis' theater, the idea of vengeance was explicitly explored and presented as a worthy pursuit in the face of injustice. The altar's relief depicts Victor as a heavy gladiator called a secator, and this image presents Victor as commendable, as commendable. Here he has the traditional sort of, um, uh, he has the palm frond showing his success and his, his wreath crown showing his success. Um, the images traditionally associated with successful athlete in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, in noting that Victor was Thessalonian, his funerary altar also indicates that Philippopolis's theater hosted gladiators that performed in Macedonia and other neighboring provinces. Uh, it thus shows that the theater promoted interregional cultural ties why, while bringing its city's population together over shared moral values. The, the decoration of what we can call roughly consumer goods sold at Philippopolis also reflects the gladiatorial games and animal hunts the theater hosted. Uh, such goods corroborate what the aforementioned funerary mime suggests, but from the point of view of perform, um, well, so the last, uh, the altar uh, talked about was presented from the point of view of performers and their loved ones. Um, and this, uh, this goods like this here um, corroborate these ideas. The idea that spectators of gladiatorial combats and animal hunts uh, took moral lessons, or they could very well, they're presented with moral lessons from these performances. And um, people then, as consumer goods like the show, wanted, in some cases, want to be reminded of these moral lessons uh, in material forms. One such consumer good found at a sanctuary in Philippopolis's hinterland is this around one meter tall limestone table support decorated with a high relief and dated to the late second, early third century. The supports um, relief shows a secutor at the ready uh, with his curved rectangular shield and sword. An inscription identifies the secutor as Epiptus, Epiptus, the striker. Epiptus has defeated Erectiarius, you see him here, uh, who appeals for mercy from a seated position. Behind the two gladiators is a referee who calls the fight. Uh, above this group of figures are two cherubs seated at a pipe organ up here. Uh, everything pictured on this table support could have been seen in Philippopolis's theater. Uh, the fact that Epiptos is named or that the gladiator is named makes it particularly likely that these supports, supports uh, relief scene commemorates an actual fight. Uh, just as it would have in the theater, the scene of Epiptus and the Retiarius conveys uh, Epiptos's uh, martial skill, his athleticism, and his mercy, and so endorses them as positive character traits. The referee between the two gladiators serves as a subtle exhortation to the viewer to respect law and order, the rules of the game, as it were. A pipe organ easily could have been played in the theater to increase audiences' excitement for gladiatorial games, thus helping to create a context for leisure and a context for uh, receiving and digesting uh, different moral values. In turn, the representation of the organ encourages appreciation of leisure's value. So in sum, the table support is a product of what we can say are several possible cultural values that theaters, that Philippopolis's theater promoted. Among its viewers then, the support was able to encourage further attendance at or friendly discussion of the gladiatorial games that promoted these values. The table support also stood to encourage the production and acquisition of additional material forms that reflected these interactions. This table support, Victor's Funeral Monument, and the invitation to a set of games found at Philippopolis, the examples I, we looked at, thus attest to the capacity of Philippopolis' theater to help determine the human, ideological, and material actors that interacted to sustain Philippopolis as a localized urban network.
There was also plentiful architectural and epigraphic evidence for how the theater prompted political interactions among spectators and performers, which is to say how it led them to interact according to a social hierarchy, shared civic pride, and distinct group identities. In terms of architectural evidence, the theater physically separated spectators from performers. The realm of the uh, spectators was the cavea, while the realm of the performers was the skena and the um, orchestra. By positioning spectators above performers, performers at performances, the podium wall around the orchestra um, was capable of reinforcing spectator's sense of superior status to that of performers. At the same time, it was by structurally facilitating the separation of performers from spectators that the theater showcased uh, performers' professions, their skill. The theater uh, was thus equipped to uh, elicit respect from the audience, and so was able to counteract this idea of low legal standing and reputation that performers generally held in the Roman world. The aforementioned gladiator funerary monument and gladiatorial themed consumer goods are evidence that this capacity was realized, that people left thinking, hey, I really enjoyed Victor's performance and things like that. Um, then there were the hillside staircases um, behind, um, behind the scene building that allowed performers ready access to the scene building and gave spectators a way to access their seats in the cavea, being additional uh, wider stairs that led to the diazema uh, between the cavea's original two tiers of seating. While performers and spectators likely used the hillside staircases behind the theater at different times, just as nowadays performers go to a theater separate than uh, spectators, it's possible that performers and spectators met at these approaches to the theater on some occasions. Such intermingling could have led, it could have fed fans' admiration for particular performers and could have either bolstered status distinctions between performers and spectators or challenged such hierarchical thinking by promoting a sense of shared community. Both possibilities are, are possible. In the theater's cavea, uh, spectators were also separated in ways that were able to highlight and so promote adherence to status distinctions. The theater stood out among other public buildings at Philippopolis for its capacity to bring together so many elites and non-elites. Philippopolis's wealthiest citizens were the most conspicuous uh, uh, spectators since they sat in the first couple of rows closest to the orchestra. Uh, especially prominent individuals like game givers, uh, they sat in a VIP box at the center of the upper tier of seating located around, about here above this uh, entrance corridor. Uh, both spaces, both spaces uh, made elites highly visible to non-elites, uh, particularly considering that elites' clothing and jewelry would have set them apart. Non-elites were arrayed behind elites according to wealth, profession, and legal status. Well-to-do non-elites sat closer to the cavea's middle, while free people of humbler means, as well as people like slaves, sat toward uh, the back. Uh, the addition of a third tier of seating in the early fourth century AD up here, as you can see from the find of these sub, this substructure, uh, the addition of this third tier of seating enabled even larger cross sections of Philippopolis's population to become more aware of status distinctions and elite privilege. Several inscribed honor honorific monuments and architectural decorations found in the theater and elsewhere at Philippopolis attest to the theater's capacity to reinforce public support for a social hierarchy. Commissioned after certain elites patronize the theater to vie for support among non-elites and each other to compete, these material actors further encouraged Philippopolis' inhabitants to view elites as key to the city's prosperity. Uh, since these, uh, these monuments, these inscribed statues, uh, were often dedicated by or to officials and governing bodies, that held authority on regional and imperial scales, these material actors stressed that Philippopolis's elite leadership depended on the city's participation in wider urban networks. That's the messaging of such monuments. Two such monuments I already mentioned are the statue bases dedicated to Julianus and Cotus. So we'll look at those next. Since Philippopolis's city council and people 
honored Julianus and Cotus with statues in the theater, their attendance of performances and assemblies here must have fueled the renown with which they were regarded. Their roles, uh, so Julianus and Cotus, their roles as imperial procurator and city and city representative, imperial priest, and priest of Asclepius, respectively, uh, urged these figures' participation on the occasions of games. Uh, these positions also make it highly likely that Julianus and Cotus funded performances in the theater and so received public acclaim while presiding over these events. The extant bases for Julianus and Cotus' statues thus exemplify pretty well the material actors that were produced because the theater provided elites prominent outlets for gaining influence over their peers, as well as over non-elites by displaying their wealth in public office. The example of Cotus' statue shows that Thracian elites, as well as those originating in other parts of the empire, were able to take advantage of the opportunities for self-aggrandizement uh, that the theater offered. Uh, once in position in the Skene Franz, statues of elites like Julian's and Cotus would have helped the theater promote the idea among spectators and performers that the leadership of an elite class with regional and interregional ties involving Rome was beneficial to Philippopolis' success. So imagine people sitting in the theater looking at these statues, at these inscriptions, maybe not able to read the inscriptions from afar, but see these statues. And the idea is, yes, this sort of structure is necessary and, and quite beneficial for Philippopolis' success as a city. While these monuments show that the theater reinforced a social hierarchy and a sense of elite sub-community at Philippopolis, other monuments manifest, manifest that the theater articulated what we can call sub-community identities or other group identities among non-elites. First, there are monuments to performers who died at Philippopolis, like the gladiator Victor. In their praise of performers' skills, these monuments show that the theater promoted a shared identity among the city's resident performers uh, and their support staff, friends, and family. Inscriptions in the lower tier of the cavea also indicate that the theater encouraged people to identify with particular civic tribes. While people, uh, prob while people possibly sat according to tribes at performances, uh, it strikes me at least, that, and some other scholars as well, that this seating arrangement is more indicative of the theater hosting civic assemblies, and so promoting civic tribal, tribal identities in these contexts rather than in performance contexts. So here are those inscriptions I just mentioned here. Uh, the inscriptions that record Philippopolis's civic tribes are repeated in different locations across the lower tier of the theater seating, um, since the space allotted to each tribe changed over time. And there were different tribe numbers uh, um, across time. When Hadrian was emperor uh, between 117 and 138, the wedges of the lower seating tier were divided among tribes named after Heracles, Philip II, Dionysus, Artemis, Orpheus, and Elmopus. Four new tribes were added when Septimius Severus was emperor at the end of the second and beginning of the third century AD, the tribes Rhodopes, Hebros, Condrissos, and Asclepios. By inspiring a sense of belonging to civic tribes through seating and assemblies, the theater could induce people to commission monuments that advertise these subcommunities. Such monuments include statue bases found in the theater that had once supported statues in the Skene Franz. One statue that was dedicated in the late second to early third century to a now unknown gymnasiarch and agonothetes game giver. Um, um, it was de dedicated by Asclepiades, son of Menaphron, on behalf of the Heraclean tribe. On behalf of the Candrisian tribe, Aurelius Apol Apolon Apolonides, son of Aelius Valens, uh, dedicated a second statue in the early 3rd century AD to Poplius Verdius Julianus and Agonothetes for a set of Pythian athletic games and a veteran and father of two military tribunes. Besides promoting a social hierarchy and senses of belonging to different sub-communities among elites and non-elites, Philippopolis' theater was able to promote a unified civic identity among disparate, gr disparate groups of its city's inhabitants. 
Despite dividing these people by wealth, profession, legal status, and sub-community identity, the theater still put all these people, all these different people, in close, sustained contact with one another in the emotionally charged contexts of public entertainments. The inscriptions on several monuments found in the theater explicitly refer to Philippopolis as a preeminent city in Thrace in various ways. So these monuments are material outcomes of the theater's capacity to promote civic identity and pride, at least among some subsections of the city and the city's inhabitants. For example, the inscriptions on the statue bases dedicated to Cotus and Julianus, they proudly refer to Philippopolis only as the metropolis. The inscription on another statue base conveys a unified civic identity among Philippopolis' inhabitants without referring to the city by name or by title. This monument dates to the first two decades of the second century AD and was found in the theater. It is dedicated to the Thracian Provincial Assembly because of the governing body's, quote, continuous goodwill. The inscription does not specify the form of this goodwill, but the statue base's location in the theater suggests, suggests the funding of performances and or the honor of the theater hosting a meeting of Thrace's provincial council. Whatever the forms of this goodwill, the statue's commemoration of the goodwill demonstrates that the theater bolstered civic pride by making its city's inhabitants aware of the importance of their interactions on a regional scale. The statue likely further promoted a civic identity by personifying the province of Thrace, perhaps, seems likely. By symbolizing Thrace, the statue, by symbolizing Thrace having a home in Philippopolis, the statue would have suggested that the city was worthy of Thrace's favor. Thrace literally had a home in the city, in its, the in its theater. Uh, in conclusion, these are only a few examples of the monuments, architectural decorations, and artifacts that, together with the remains of Philippopolis' theater, demonstrate and suggest ways by which the entertainment venue shapes human, material, and ideological aspects of urban life at a leading city in inland Roman Thrace. In its architectural form and overlapping cultural, political, religious, and economic functions, which I've only really touched on here, uh, Philippopolis' theater bears many similarities to theaters in Macedonia. These similarities show the interconnectedness of Macedonian Thrace as regional urban networks. These similarities also reinforce that connections with communities in nearby and farther regions of the Roman Empire greatly informed urban life across both provinces and then dioceses in the late first to early fourth century AD. At the same time though, Philippopolis' theater participated in the interactions um, that sustained life in its city in ways that represent considerable local life, local flavor, local agency. In other words, the theater promoted a sense of urbanism that was local, regional, and imperial all at once. Through my study of public entertainment venues in Roman Thrace then, my overall conclusion regarding urbanism and its relationship with empire is this. Urbanism gained greater prominence as a way of life in Thrace, particularly inland Thrace, between the late first and fourth centuries AD because it afforded, it provided, it offered many new opportunities for interactions. These interactions followed certain conventions, but still left individuals and communities considerable leeway to present themselves in various overlapping, overlapping and perhaps conflicting ways. Granted, Roman governors and emperors had a vested interest in promoting urbanism since it consolidated provincial populations interactions at particular locations, and so helped uh, imperial authorities monitor and manage the empire's territories. Urbanism's ties to exploitative ideas and practices across the Roman Empire should therefore not be forgotten. Still, by encouraging more interactions of various kinds among people differentiated by wealth, profession, legal status, ethnicity, etc., Roman urbanism did in many ways enable provincial communities to use participation in the empire to their advantage. Thank you very much for your, for your attention.
and I'm happily take all sorts of questions and comments. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for this uh, very interesting lecture, which uh, introduced us all to some um, new perspectives, possibly. Uh, it was really interesting for me uh, to see also all the other uh, perspectives presented in one lectures because usually um, most of the publications are focusing on one uh, or another uh, function um, of these kind of buildings. So um, whatever questions uh, they are, please feel free to start asking. I would suggest that whoever has a question can raise uh, their hand or uh, just write the questions in the chat, whatever you feel, whatever way you prefer. So please go ahead. So the first question is from uh, Carol Schneier. Uh, so how has the theater, sorry, how has the theater been used in modern times? Has it been fitted with a good sound system? Uh, I, I actually don't. Good question. I don't know too much as much as perhaps others know about the modern accoutrements of the theater. But I mean, every time I go there, it's outfitted in some new way to, for some other <laughs> performance. Um, this this is not the most recent photos I've taken in the theater. Um, more recent ones have been in uh, 2017, um, and they had a sort of more of a scaffolding going on um, with lights hanging down from it. Um, so it, it looks like generally speaking, when they're a, a using the theater um, for modern performances, they, they bring in a new, uh, new configurations of lighting and things. It doesn't seem to be, from what I can tell, um, any much permanent um, uh, speaker installation, things like that, light installation. I think it's a lot of, it's, I think it's a very modular approach to to theater, which is very, you know, of course, very, very modern, a very modern thing. We had over here, uh, the, not the last summer, the, but the summer of 2019, there was an amazing um, festival, opera festival over there. So with uh, the participants of one of the field schools uh, in a town nearby, we attended two performances. One of them was Otello, I believe, and it was amazing. It was amazing. So I wish you all to have the chance to uh, present the performance like this, uh, hopefully when the pandemic is over. And we can see here another question, this time by our colleague Luba Manuova. So Luba, please feel free to ask your question. Um, it's more of a comment in answer to that question about how it's used today. So I've been to several concerts there, like classical concerts, rock concerts. So the acoustics in general are pretty good, like the shape of it kind of helps for it. Uh, as far as I know, each like performer brings their own stuff. They're only fixing accommodations and like changing rooms and stuff. There have been major improvements over the years. And I think, um, I don't know when those plays you mentioned were, but there was like one particular play the classical play Medea, which was performed here. And from I couldn't attend, I was excavating at the time. But from what people tell me, it was an amazing performance, like to see it live in the Asian theater again. So there's all kinds of um, things happening there. And uh, it's getting better and better as a venue. OK, thank you. So uh, we can probably continue with another question uh, from Ian. What kind of animals would be involved in the animal hunts? Right, uh, good question. Um, so we don't, you know, we we don't always have as much information as we'd like. Um, I, what first comes to mind, because we have that fragmentary in, in Vitatio um, from, um, uh, from Philippopolis. Um, and so it's fragmentary, you don't get a full sense of what's going on in those performances. Um, but um, some other examples that we know from other in, in Watationes, invitations, um, there's a very famous one from the early fourth century AD from Sertica, um, just up the road from Philippopolis and, and north, northwestern uh, Thrace. Um, and it shows bears and bulls. Um, and, and these were sort of more, these, these are animals that could be more locally sourced. Um, Bears and bulls that could be are, are, could be available. Um, you have example of um, in that in invitation you have a relief showing a deer, 
uh, some deer of some type. So that's possible. That relief also shows an alligator. It's kind of interesting to think, is that a real, supposed to be a real alligator or like a prop alligator? It, it looks really in the inscription, in the relief, it looks very fake, but that could just be a, a stylistic thing. Um, um, we also know, generally speaking, that it, at some uh, entertainments, there were big cats, uh, lions, things like that. And I mean, I would say that since we have evidence um, in, in the lower rows here, so in this, in this slide, you can see some hints of these post holes in the bottom here. Um, since there was a netting system, I would say there's a high, high possibility that there were, uh, and, you know, uh, commonly enough, uh, big cats with a big jump dis um, height um, in, the, in the arena orchestra here. Well, okay, thank you. So the next question again uh, by Karol Schneier. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, what evidence has been uncovered as to how the theater was used? Right, right. So how was the theater used in late antiquity? Um, there's, there is some, some evidence. Um, it looks like the, um, what's the exact date? I think it was in the fourth, end of the fourth century, there was an earthquake. And so the thought is there was an earthquake and a fire and the theater burned and was destroyed um, and wasn't really reusable. Chances are because there weren't a lot of public funds to um, rebuild it. Um, so I think after the late fourth century, it was um, you know, kind of filled in um, and uh, not, you know, not used as a performance venue anymore um, and used probably as a quarry to some extent, um, to some extent. Okay, so then uh, we have a question by Linda Honey. Uh, thanks, Matt. Great job. Could you put back up on the screen the inscription of uh, Titus Flavius Cotis for a minute? Yes, of course. And uh, have you come across any inscriptions to Queen Antonia uh, Trifena? Sorry. Say it again. Um, have you come across to uh, across any inscriptions to Queen Antonia Trifena? Off the top of my head, I could be might have to go back through them. Um, not that I know of, no, not that I know of. Perhaps I missed something, but I yeah, not that I know off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. So again, by Carol Schneier, how was the hard archaeological evidence uh, like architecture, spolio, spolio limestone, slab, stable, leg, etc., supported, refuted by uh, writers from the period? That was a hard um, support refuted by. Um, oh, as in. Um, as if refuted, or maybe refuted in what what way? Refuted by writers from the period. Um, well, when it comes to writers from the period, I mean, generally we don't have any writers um, that are referring. We don't have any textual evidence um, for uh, performances or people coming together in theater. Um, and, and yeah, so that, that so it's really the archaeology we're looking at the inscriptions um, and the. Um, yeah, that's, that's really it. It's, so it's a great case for sort of looking at what the archaeology has because the textual source can't really serve us. Okay. Unfortunately. Uh, the next question comes by Hans Krauch and it's more general question about the gladiators. So would they be trained locally or uh, are they more of a traveling show? Right. I think that's okay. So that's a, I mean, it's a, Good, it's a really good question, and we don't really know perhaps as much as we would like. I mean, we certainly do have uh, extensive uh, ideas of a uh, gladiatorial troops and sort of traveling. Um, my my bet is that we probably had a lot of traveling uh, troops going through uh, Philippopolis and Macedonia Thrace. And my I, I my bet. I know I don't have anything concrete to really support that, but I did look example. I mean, there's an example of Victor. Victor's from Thessalonica and that he's, he's up in Thrace. You know, it's not that far away. It's in neighboring provinces, but that he's up there suggests to me that we're dealing with, I mean, he could have lived there for some time, could have been residents at Philippopolis for some time. But my, my bet is that um, you have these traveling groups and they kind of travel around the province. And so you're probably, maybe you're talking about a, a situation where Victor is part of a, a troop that goes back and forth between Macedonia and Thrace and communities around. Um, I know there's, um, there's some, I think there was, 
a, a gladiator name that we know from inscription of Martian uh, up in Martianopolis, northeastern Thrace. Um, that's a name I came across in another inscription uh, a bit further south. And so I think you have some some light evidence, at least, that suggests these gladiators are moving around regionally, at least. Um, so my bet is you have mostly gladiatorial troops that kind of stick around the regions, move around. But then you had probably some maybe light training um, and in some sort of facility at Philippopolis. Um, but I mean, this, that's a big question. There's a lot of unknowns there, unfortunately. Okay, so um, the next question comes uh, from Ilona Ilieva. Uh, even though our evidence is limited, uh, do we have an indication of what language languages were the performances in, uh, in the theater held in? Right. I, I, had, I had this question before, and it's a good one. <laughs> we don't we don't know. Um, now, I mean, when we're talking about sort of the, the language that we're seeing on inscriptions, the language that we're seeing sort of material forms based on archaeology, we're seeing a lot of Greek. Um, and so my bet, my bet is that these performances are being done in Greek, though I, we don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to necessarily put too firm a, a point on that. But my bet is Greek. Um, but of course, I mean, we should imagine that Thracian as a language is probably being used as a language to some extent. Um, Latin, I would guess not Latin because Latin was very much an administrative language. Um, we only really see it on a, a sort of a few inscriptions. I would say not Latin. My bet would be Greek um, because I, by this point, especially if we're talking about the elites and uh, 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 well-educated folks um, in, in Thrace, as well as Macedonia, they would have known, they would have known Greek. Uh, Greek. Um, and so my, yeah, my bet is that they're, we're talking about uh, performances in Greek. Okay, so another question by Carol Schneier. Uh, taking a modern analogy to a saucer stadium, how much could a future archeologist deduce about modern society from looking at the architecture seating arrangements? Right. Right, exactly. So I think I'm very much a proponent of using thoughts about modern stadiums, modern public entertainment to promote thinking about ancient entertainment venues. And that's a direction I see my research going um, further more um, in the future that go forward, more of the economic sort of impact economic uh, situations around public entertainments and their venues. Um, because we've, we're, the archaeological uh, evidence is coming out. So um, if we look at other parts of the empire, uh, I think it's the amphitheater at Chester. Uh, excavations um, looked around, right around the amphitheater, and they found post holes for stalls that were set up right outside the theater. Um, in, uh, I forgot which exact example we have. In other parts of the empire, we have examples of um, some like a light and sort of inscriptions on the outside of it of the amphitheater says that indicates a stall, a certain type of vendor stall was set up there. Um, a really great example of thinking about at least e economic interactions and, um, around, around entertainment venues in the ancient world is Carnuntum. Uh, at Carnuntum the, in, in Austria, modern Austria, they've um, done a lot of um, subsurface detection methods um, and they found a gladiator um, training school nearby that amphitheater at Carnuntum, as well as a bunch of stores um, places that could seem to be very much stores. Um, and so just in, I mean, I went, my mind went straight to uh, economics, but I think generally speaking, um, looking to modern public entertainment, uh, you know, football, <laughs> European football or American football and, uh, things like that. Um, I think they can give us really great, great, great food for thought and expand our, our minds when approaching the ancient, the ancient, um, context of public entertainment. Okay, and then uh, there, there is another question by uh, Carol Schneier. Houses of uh, worship are also places for large public gatherings and public ceremonies. What might have been the relationship between the theater and religious ceremonies? Right. So um, I think, I mean, again, a big open question, but um, I do, and we do know that across the empire, um, gods were very much everywhere in public entertainments. I mean, most of these entertainments um, is, were dedicated in, in some way to um, deities um, uh, or the imperial cults. And even, even those, in those games where 
um, glide twirl games, to animal hunts, which are typically, scholars don't think were always dedicated to a particular god. They were a lot of times dedicated to the imperial cult. Um, and, and deities would have been invoked, invoked a lot. So one common deity that's invoked a lot in connection to the imperial cult is Nemesis. Um, basically, wherever you, it's almost to a point that wherever you see inscriptions dedicated to Nemesis, you gotta, it's, almost, not completely, but almost a sure, ev sure evidence that there's an entertainment venue nearby. Not always, but um, Nemesis is one of the examples of a goddess that's very much associated with the gladiatorial games and um, animal hunts. Um, but in terms of uh, worship, I think you, you would see, I, I'm betting you would, you, you would be countered a bunch of acclamations, images of gods. So a Nemesis, for example, did have some shrines um, in, um, in theaters, a great example of a, of a shrine to Nemesis at a theater is the theater at Stoby. There is a shrine to Nemesis, which with inscriptions of Nemesis, bits of statues of Nemesis in the, in the center of the scene building there. Uh, so that's an example of a type of shrine to a specific deity in a theater. So we certainly have evidence of shrines at Heraclea and Lycestis. The, the thought is that a round sort of niche at the back of the seating area also held a shrine to Nemesis. Um, so there, there are some examples of shrines and certainly in theaters, standard um, statuary include a bunch of images of gods. We don't really have images of gods for Philippopolis's theater, um, but they were very common sorts of um, decorations in, in Skene Franzes and also in, um, you know, in the out interior, exterior decoration of amphitheater as well. Um, uh, so even then, even though you may not actually have an actual acclamation in a particular set of games of series, for example, her image may very well be in the skinny fronds, prompting a sort of uh, opportunity for a spectator to consider that deity and the spectator's sort of relationship with that deity. Um, so you're kind of talking about a combination of shrines, acclamations of certain deities, and images of certain deities in the theater and that's sort of how theaters and other public entertainment venues promoted worship. Okay, um, then uh, Tara Gaduri, I hope that yeah, I'm pronouncing your name right, is asking, uh, has this theater always been known about uh, since antiquity or, or was it discovered, uh, rediscovered? Was it a surprise to find it here, as you mentioned, the common conception is that buildings like this were viewed as uncommon. Right, um, so theater Philippopolis, um, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think, I don't necessarily think they were expecting to find a theater there, but the most excavations were in the, uh, excavation started there in the 70s, I think it was. I'm sure the people here in this presentation that re remember this more readily than I do, but I think as 70s and 80s, um, and I don't, I don't think I didn't, from, I get the impressions of the publications that are out there. I don't get the impressions they knew a theater was there. Um, but generally speaking, I think people, scholars expect at larger cities and people, I think knew even from early on that Philippopolis is one of the larger urban centers in Thrace and scholars generally expect to find um, entertainment venues at larger urban centers, because as I said, they really seem to be um, necessary for what you can call advanced urbanism, sort of these larger centers, they seem to be sort of pretty, pretty significant. Um, and I would almost go to say necessary aspects of, um, of larger cities, urban landscapes. Um, so generally, I would say, no, it probably is not really surprised that there was a theater at Philippopolis. Um, I don't think they necessarily expected to find where they did. And then there were those excavations, I think, in the 70s, 80s, maybe the end, late 70s or and continued to the 80s. Um, and I do want to specify, unfortunately, as, as of yet, the, the theater is not fully published. Um, there are a lot of publications out there, but uh, in terms of sort of the, the really nitty gritty archaeological details of its excavation, those are not fully published. I think so. Uh, Sabrina Abedi is asking, uh, given your definition of uh, urbanism of Tracia, what do you think we can pull from your study to apply to modern urbanism? What lessons can we learn to promote cultural uh, mingling? Right, <laughs> right. Well, it's always, it, I think a lot of times it's, it's a good question because it's also, um, 
you know, I do want to highlight, and it's kind of highlight the end of my talk there. Uh, I don't think it was necessarily um, a goal of, uh, <laughs> of certainly Roman administrators to necessarily promote cultural um, <laughs> dialogue and multicultural um, interactions. I think it just, it just happens when you, I think it's a side effect of we can, we call globalization nowadays. And certainly in a, a Roman, in the Roman empire, I think it's a big side effect of imperialism. People from um, different sort of walks of life, from different ethnicities, from different origins coming together. Um, and so in terms of, and so I think we can take certainly lessons from how to go forward here. Um, and I think in terms of building cities, and I think this is something that city planners think of nowadays, like how do you, and if you want to get people of different walks of life, in, uh, walking and talking together, intermingling, it's, it's, you have to sort of give them opportunities to do that. Um, and, it, and something that certainly in European cities do a lot better than American cities, um, just like pedestrian walkways was one example. Pedestrian walkways are not too common in cities in the U.S., but they're, you know, they're a great way for people to come together in a lot of European cities. I mean, I keep remembering Bitola and uh, Chirac Sokak and <laughs> that wide street in Bitola and just people walking up and down and up and down, eating, drinking, laughing. And it's just, and that's a, 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 even just a wide street like that is, can really sort of boost people coming together and integrating and intermingling. Um, so I think if you're looking from a modern urban city planning perspective and you look at sort of antiquity and think how can we sort of um, uh, get people together, um, it's like giving them the, 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 the opportunities, um, a space for people. So large volume spaces, spaces that get people um, um, doing things in many types of things, not just one type of activity, but multiple types of activities. Um, and you can think back to the modern stadiums. People go there and they, you know, they, they interact with their friends. They have some to eat. Uh, they maybe go to a bar afterwards and drink. And so if you're looking from a modern urban planning perspective, like, hey, boost that sort of activity and bring people and give people a, a sort of a lot of activities and, and, and high emotion activities as we're experienced together. Um, I, so maybe that goes toward answering your question somewhat. Um, but I think there are a lot of lessons we can learn here. Definitely we can. Um, well, uh, the next question is partly connected to this one, actually. Modern theater stadiums are surrounded by a cloud of yeah. uh, vendors selling refreshments, memorabilia, souvenirs, etc. Was there any evidence of similar economic activities surrounding the theater? Right. And I, I kind of addressed this already. Um, but what I, what's interesting is I know at Philippopolis, going back to Philippopolis, we don't really have yet... Um, there certainly are down the hill from the down the hill from the theater. There have been excavations recently, um, and we do know of one type of store. <laughs> well, I won't say store. I'll take a type of shopping loosely defined. Uh, down the hill from the the theater, we do. Uh, are, there was the publication that there were some brothels down the hill from the theater, and so I mean this would certainly, if we know from the example of Pompeii and other ancient cities, that was a form of commerce, uh, certainly in the ancient world. And it wouldn't surprise me if people, and, and that's general in the area of the theater, it wouldn't surprise me if, uh, you know, there were some stores down there near those brothels and those were catering to people who were on game days going up to the theater, coming down from the theater. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, so I think the evidence for commerce or uh, economic interactions around Phil Poplis's theater, I think that's emerging emerging still um, and generally across the people, the scholars are paying more attention to sort of the economic impact of public entertainment, which is really cool. Um, and then more of that evidence is, is going to be, it's going to be coming out. Um, uh, yeah. But again, I do think thinking about modern theaters and stadiums is a great way to get our minds learning about where to look, what type of things to look for, um, what maybe not necessarily to expect, but just keep an eye out for. Well, then, uh, is there any evidence of alcohol consumption at ancient performances or perhaps prohibition of alcohol so the crowd doesn't get too uh, rowdy? Uh, no, no. I would say, as far as I know, and this is thinking with examples I know empire wide, but obviously I know more familiar with what's going on in Macedonia Thrace, but um, no, there's no direct evidence for alcohol consumption or prohibitions 
we do have evidence for shattered vessels, you know, of types around um, entertainment venues. So when we dug a Heraclea, we found examples of ceramics, you know, some of the ceramic, that ceramic evidence probably came from elsewhere. It's hard to tell, but, you know, we can imagine for some of it, perhaps staying roughly in place. It's hard to say, um, but I would, I, again, it's, <laughs> I'm kind of, I wish I wouldn't have to say I could bet a lot, or I, I think, but I, I would say that people are probably drinking wine um, and, and enjoying some alcoholic beverages near, near these venues. And I, I think we have maybe indirect for evidence for that in the form of ceramic vessel fragments in the areas of entertainment vessel, um, entertainment venues. But again, term, in terms of clearer evidence, more direct evidence, eh, we don't really have that, unfortunately. Um, um, can I ask something? So yes, uh, I, I couldn't find how to raise my hand for some reason. Um, so, so first of all, oh, I'm extremely impressed by uh, uh, the, the best combination of theory with uh, data and evidence. Uh, and uh, also uh, as a prehistoric archeologist, uh, our main uh, consol consolation uh, uh, is that, you know, we prehistorians, we have bad data. It's not as uh, Greek and Roman times with uh, inscriptions, with authors, with uh, everything, but we are good theoreticians. We do a good theory, so we have ideas. And now I see that uh, <laughs> we have to learn things from you, the <laughs> Roman archaeologist. And uh, no, uh, no joke. I'm very impressed by your uh, actor ne network theory approach and by the definition of urbanism. Uh, I don't follow so much Roman archaeology, but up till now, uh, uh, I've seen only checklists. So urbanism, uh, architectural checklists. Uh, uh, romanization checklist mm -hmm. and what you are doing is to to go to the functions to the practices which is a, a completely new dimension um so my first two questions are very uh, out of uh, historic ignorance um forgive me just give a short answer was there a theater in the hellenistic period in Philippopolis. In Philippopolis, no, there was no no theater in, in Hellenic period. Uh, so the Romans uh, built it. Right. It it does. Yes. It was built in the late, like the tail end of the late first century AD. Yeah. Okay. 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 Then I move to the next question. Is there some evidence of uh, different repertoire in theaters in different provinces? For example, in Spain. One thing fitting local elites or uh, one kind of uh, purposes, and on the other end of the empire, a different uh, repertoire in use of these theaters. How regional are they? Right. I, you know, and that's, I mean, it's, I think there's a great deal of regionalism there. Um, there, I mean, you have. Standard functions, you have standard forms, but in each of these parts of the empire, there is a fair deal. I mean, a fair deal of different different forms. Um, I mean, if you're looking in, if, for example, if you look over in Gaul, if you look over in Gaul, you have sort of these weird sort of um, theater amphitheaters, but they're kind of different than the amphitheaters you get over in Thrace that start appearing in the late third century that are not as far as we can tell, it seems they're not the full seating around. So if you look like the amphitheater at Sertica and the amphitheater at Hisaria that were built late third, early fourth, you have sort of like a oval arena, but the seating is like really over one side. So you have sort of even in this amphitheater form, yes, the Thracian examples seem to be similar to the Gallic examples, but they're still, if you look at them, they're still quite different. Um, and that's just in terms of architectural form. And there's there's evidence uh, about sort of different functional approaches too. Yeah, so obviously here the Hellenistic background is, is strong, as you said. Um, the next naive question, was everyone allowed to come to, to, to enter the theater? Uh, did you have to be a citizen? Did you have to be dressed in a kind of way or you can come from the mountains, uh, uh, shepherd, uh, stinking, barbarian? And the next question, was it expensive? 
Right. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns about who exactly was in the audience. It's so hard to tell because we don't, we have the, the, without the written sources and not like, it's not as if we wouldn't be able to know without written sources that the, even the archeology span just doesn't quite tell us exactly who's in the theater. But um, generally if we look around the empire and we look at, we'll focus on Thrace. There's no, incl- there's no indication that anyone was explicitly excluded. Um, and the idea is generally that um, seating was free, but it was first come first serve. Um, so you certainly had, um, you certainly had the elites that had first dibs. Um, and you do have some examples of seating of family names with individual names on certain seats. And so we, we do have the material evidence that some people were able to pay for the privilege to have uh, assigned seats. And so you can imagine then that sort of pushed out a bunch of people that maybe just came for game day. But, um, and a, um, an, a scholar um, that I know is doing a lot of work about thinking about who's in theaters and what type of people, uh, Jack Hansen, his research is, um, um, there's a bunch of articles he's um, put out recently. Um, and he, he's talking about, you know, who, what percentage of maybe elites versus non-elites we should think are in the, in the audience. Yeah. There's a lot of unknowns, but generally there's no explicit um, prohibitions against any type of people. I mean, if a stinky shepherd <laughs> was able to sort of grab a seat uh, early on game day, then I think he would have been fine. Maybe uh, people would have given him a little bit of white berth as they go up to take their seats or when they're sitting next to him. But there's no indication that that person would have been excluded. Um, we do have examples of seating tokens. Um but it's not necessarily, we don't always get the sense that these seating tokens meant you had to pay for your spot. Um, they could have just been handed out ahead of time to make sure you got a spot. Um, so there's not necessarily an indication these seating tickets indicate payment. Um, so generally seems like no prohibitions. They were free, but first, first come, first serve. And if you had the money, you could pay for your own assigned seat. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Um, two short questions. Can I, uh, Angela? Do we have one more minute? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, if if you take uh, Bulgaria in the 19th century uh, AD, the, the the late Ottoman time, so the the century before the creation of the modern state, and um, you see that you have three big uh, cities: uh, Plovdiv, Ruse, and Varna. And none of the national heroes, uh, these guys who in some way uh, fought uh, uh, against the Ottoman Empire, was born there. All huh. these guys were born in small places. Huh. Uh, so my question is, what is the shift between imperial control in the early century of uh, Roman trace? What is the shift between Plovdiv and the surrounding. So this goes beyond your topic and I apologize, it might not be, but if you do a survey 50 kilometers away uh, or 100, how Roman uh, would you expect to be the countryside? Right, I think this, I mean, it is sort of outside of where I've done my research in the past, but these, you bring up a question and it's tied to the, the line of questioning that I would very much like to pursue going forward. Um, I want to know, because we, I mean, certainly the sense that even just looking at the cities like Philippopolis, looking at public entertainment venues that are very much sort of urbanism, <laughs> capital U, um, a city is nothing without its, its hinterland. Um, and I get the sense that, I mean, throughout, uh, I mean, the cities, they need the hinterland and whatever whatever's going on in the hinterland is very much integral to life in the city. Um, so I would like to move my research going forward there. And certainly research has been has been done around, um, um, I think a lot of the, the good juicy archeological data is kind of scattered in some annual reports. Unfortunately, it's, I think it's some of it's there and more of it's emerging. Um, but I think we're, I, I think uh, you're seeing a lot of fun. You're probably seeing a lot of really fun stuff in the, in the hinterland of Philippopolis. I think you're seeing probably a lot of smaller farms. Um, we do know that there, are uh, from the example of, um, uh, Augusta Triana, you know, Star Zagora. Um, you have, um, we have examples of sort of villas um, and uh, elite sort of elite houses out there. And so I think you can imagine very similar situation in Philippopolis. And I'm sure we have some ev- evidence, concrete evidence pointing this way. 
of the elites that sort of participated and ran things at Philippopolis. They had these lovely villas that they would go to and live in outside the city. Um, and so I think you have sort of these, these sort of forces that in the past people have really pointed to local elites. Well, they're part, they're really participating in this Roman imperial system. And so they have a stake in it and they're, they're willing to, to perpetuate it. Um, but I do think we also have a lot of people living outside the city that are just going about their lives, not necessarily thinking about, you know, <laughs> Roman, Roman overlords necessarily. Um, we, and when I think there's a lot of great stuff around um, the client kingdom of Thrace between the late, the mid first century BC and mid first century AD. I mean, you have that, you have that great example of um one of the Thracian client kings, one of the younger ones, and it's a literary uh, evidence, a literary citation, that he was with his Roman uh, guardian, and you have um, a revolt, and you have sort of the, the, uh, the I think it was a Bessie, and some elements of the Drusai, they were coming at the, the city, and you sort of have him sort of, <laughs> that uh, client king, his forces sequestered inside the city. But you do get a sense then from that literary example um, in that point in history that there are people around in the environs that aren't, at least in this early time, on board with Roman control. Um, and I'm, I'm betting that when you fast forward a couple centuries, there's people in the countryside, they're living simply, and they don't necessarily, who the emperor is or who the governor does, doesn't really factor into their daily life much, much. I, I smell in the air a postdoc uh, project or uh, a project uh, for about a Roman villa or something in the countryside. <laughs> that'd be that'd be great. Linking the, the linking these cities to their hinterlands. That's what what that's the great work that we yeah. all need to be pushing. I think. And and my last question. Sorry for asking so much, but I told you it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, again, prehistorians' ignorance. Um, my starting point is again Plovdiv in the in the 19th century AD, so late uh, Ottoman Empire. Um, in this town, there were almost no Bulgarian speaking people. Uh, most of them spoke Greek, Turkish, Armenian. My grand grandmother uh, was so my mother was born in Sofia, but their parents were in Plovdiv, mm. and uh, I know a little bit this from the family history. Uh, they b were bilingual, but uh, uh, most of their names were Greek and so. My grand-grandfather, who came from another small town, Bitula, were fluent in Turkish and Armenian because these were the languages of uh, uh, the, the market. Uh, they were tradesmen. Uh, could it be that in the first century AD, no one in this town called himself tra Tracian? Uh, Thracians. So I know you, you should be politically correct and you don't you don't want to tell Bulgarians that uh, there were no Thracians in, in Thracian towns in the first century AD, but uh, could this be the case? It could be. I, I think there would be. I mean, like it, just the example you have up here on the screen, like Tavius Falvius Cotus. I mean, he's an elite, so, you know, he's he has money, he can defend his position in society, but he's not hiding that he's a that he's uh, has this traditional sort of Thracian name, um, so I, I I do think we, we we would have people that are fine quite fine with calling attention to the Thracian ancestry at least uh, at least early on. Um, we do get I mean there's a whole lot of discussion about who was living in the cities of course in Roman times and a lot of scholars um, had, had called attention to probably a large portion of immigrants from um, Im immigrant elites and non elites from uh, the Asian provinces. Um, and there's a big thought that when you're talking about city dwellers, you're thinking a lot, you're talking a lot about uh, immigrants from these areas. And, you know, it's hard to say. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's also a good question, like, are, you know, maybe we don't see Thracian names exhibited in the, the, the epigraphy, but, I mean, just because I mean, if we see more of like an Eastern name, maybe that's also someone who has um, origin in Thrace, but they've chosen to take on a, sort of that type of name. Uh, I think that's a, sort of an interesting thought and one to pursue. So I wouldn't necessarily say that there's people that were, you know, uh, uh, playing down their Thracian ancestry living in the city, but it, there's a lot of evidence. It's hard to say. I mean, we, we look, if you look at onomastics, you do get a lot of names that sound very, sort of traditionally like Greekish, but 
again, who are these people really? Are they immigrants or are they people from Thrace? They could very well be both. It's hard to tell just from the names alone. Um, but I think I think I, I really like that you're that that the, the thinking about more recent history and using that as food for thought. And it's, I, yeah, I, I really, I think that's great food for thought. Uh, and it's certainly, I, I, yeah, I think it's great stuff to think about. Thank you, Matthew. Most inter interesting Roman lecture was about Roman and archeology span I have ever attended. <laughs> thank you. This is like a great compliment, Matt. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, I agree with so your point, Matt, about the onomastic, that it can be pretty misleading, even right. having named Flavius Scottish here. So as you can imagine, this is a kind of a king's name from the earlier right. period. But whoever was hidden behind it, it's difficult to say. Well, there we have a couple more questions um, in the chat. So three, uh, is there any evidence of uh, ancient tickets? If so, what media, uh, paper, ceramic, or lithic? Right. So we do. Um, I think we do actually have an example from Philippopolis. Um, I think, I don't remember what material that is, but we have a great example. We, we didn't find it in our excavations at Heraclea, but at Heraclea, there was found a little bone, a little polished bone ticket. And you can see that in any sort of publications on Heraclea and Kestis and near modern Bitola. Um, and they had like a row number, seat number. I think it was like, I think I, I'm imagining in my head, I think it was like row delta one, seat 14 or something like that. And like the 14, it was fun. The 14 wasn't, uh, it was in Roman numerals. It wasn't XIV, it was XIIII. <laughs> so it was kind of, that's kind of fun to local variants. Like we don't do the IV, we do the, um, so yeah, we do have evidence for tickets and it looks like a lot of them, the ones I know of are bone, uh, polished bone, probably some ceramic as well. Um, but we do have Emma's from the empire. Well, interesting for Heraclea, as far as I can remember, was that they firstly found the ticket. Yeah. That they knew that there must uh, must have been a theater there. And only later on, after they started excavating, they found the theater. Right. right. There. Yeah. Well, uh, was there any evidence of? A temporary covering over the theater, for example, shade or rain protection. Right. Uh, no, no. As far uh, yeah, no, not for Philippopolis theater. As far as I know, there was no evidence. I think that for a uh, lichnidus for Ochri, there was something. As far as I can. Was remember. there? Oh, okay. I, I mean, these are some memories from the last couple of years when we visited the theater. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, okay, uh, and then what role did the uh, the Via Diagonalis play? So well, I think a, hmm? yeah, I, I would think a big role. I mean, these these Roman roads were, of course, not only bringing troops in the early days, but I think people just like any like the highway system in the U.S. and any highway system across the world. Um, you know, in the U.S., they were they were initially the, the big idea was, oh, build them for military, uh, uh, so reserve troops or national guard troops and get around the country lickety split. But, you know, who mostly uses the highway system? Well, it's people, civilians, non-military people. And I think um, when you're talking about the Via Diagonalis and how it sort of crosses through uh, by Philippopolis, uh, I think you're getting a lot of, uh, that's a big reason for Philippopolis's growth. Um, is the people that are coming along that road, whether they're legionaries, legionary veterans, or look for a new place to live, traders, immigrants from um, the area of Mesia, uh, toward up near modern Serbia, or from down from the other side going up. Um, but I think the yeah, Via Diagonalis, Diagonalis played a huge role for Philippopolis's growth and for the growth of a bunch of um, villages, towns, uh, what have you in inland Thrace. Okay, so thank you, Matt, for that. It was this was the last uh, question in the chat. Are there any more questions? Anyone else? And this was also the longest discussion we have so far in our BEMA seminars. You think so? It's yeah, indicative. Well, I also have a question then. Uh, well, it's mainly regarding the entertainment venues in general. Yes. So. Uh, is it any kind of uh, coinciding functions of the different entertain entertainment venues? Oh, like them working together? Yeah. Yeah. Um, at Philippopolis, yes. Um, 
that's a great example because Phil Popples has a stadium, the stadium. So I, if you're, if I can go back to, I'll put, I have the map here. I can show it ah, right here. So the stadium um, is, it's pretty clear, not clear, but it, it dates to the early second century AD time of Hadrian uh, is sort of consensus now. And it's right down the hill. Um, and we have, um, we have the, um, the inscriptions in the early third century talking about the Pythian athletic games. And we know that Pythian style athletic games, they not only tail athletics, but they also entail um, sort of dramatic performances of certain types. Um, and so I think that's a great example that epigraphic evidence um, pointing to uh, people experiencing game days um, between going between the theater and the, um, and the stadium. Because I, I mean, stadiums, it, it, they were able to, um, around the Roman world, they could have hosted um, small theatrical performances and displays. But since the theater's right there, I'm thinking you, that's, you're having people going back and forth. They're going to the theatrical performances up on the hill and they're coming down for the athletic games down below. Um, so that's a, that's a great example for Bill Popolis of those two entertainment venues working uh, together. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you're welcome.